Good evening, folks. Good to see everyone back out this evening. Pray the Lord meets with us, gives us a, a good service tonight. Um, Brother Eric Valance, would you lead us in prayer, please? You know, if we got a problem, uh, health-wise, heart-wise, whatever, we can take it to the Lord. And this song right here, page 13, the All-American Church Hymnal, I Must Tell Jesus. If you would, stand and let's sing as unto the Lord. I must tell Jesus.
good to be here. We'd like to welcome you tonight. If you're here first time, will you raise your hand? We'll give you a card and let you fill it out and drop in the plate. And pastor, somebody's a hand over here. All right. This brother here. All right. And where are you from, brother? New York. Okay. All right. Anybody else first time tonight? Well, good to have all of you. Amen. Home folk, visitors, whoever you might be. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Be having uh, afterglow here in a few minutes. And been praying about this weather clearing up. It's pouring the rain. I left here and got home. The sun was shining. And uh, so, you know, I hope it stays clear so the kids can have a good time, enjoy themselves. We'll meet again Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for prayer meeting. Wednesday night, 7, even, 7 o'clock in the evening for prayer meeting. So y'all keep that in mind. All right, okay, brother. I'd like to invite the choir up. We'll be singing out of the All-American Church Hymnal, page 167. Oh, I want to see him. All that will come and sing.
If you would stand again, let's take our All American Church hymnal, turn to page number 59. I will sing the wonder story. Let's do the first, second, the last verse. <laughs> Be seated as the choir comes down. Come up here tonight. We'll take up the evening offering. Father, thank you, Lord. One more time, you've allowed me to come to your house. One more time, I've awakened. One more time, one more day, one more blessing. And we thank you tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Use this that's given for the glory of God. In thy name I pray. Amen.
have, we have Michelle Keaton going to be singing for us. That means you can do nothing, nothing. All right, if you have your Bibles, you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16 with me tonight, please. Verse number 31. And we start reading with verse number 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Father, bless your word now. Lord, I need wisdom, Father. I don't want to mislead anybody. This is important. In thy name I pray. Amen. The Philippian jailer, this is Philippi. The Apostle Paul addressed a letter to the church at Philippi. And the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now some say that he's simply saying, How am I going to be saved from the imminent judgment that's going to come upon me by the keepers, the, the higher, the officers and all? I don't believe that. I believe he was concerned for his soul. And the reason I do is because at midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. And sure, I'm sure that the jailer heard them also. And I'm sure it's, it, uh, it struck their uh, curiosity. Why are these men locked up the way they are, uh, still singing praises unto God? Praise is, uh, is unattached to your circumstances. Praise has to do with what's in the heart. Praise does not originate from hop, the English word hop, hap. We get happy from that word. It simply means the circumstances. Her hap was to lie upon the field of Boaz. So we read here, it says, what must I do to be saved? Now, there's no greater question that you'll ever ask yourself in this life than that one, that one, that question right there. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So I want you to go with me to the book of, of Luke chapter 23 tonight. And let's try to answer that. Would you do that with me? Luke chapter 23 and verse number 39. The scripture says, And this superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now, Pontius Pilate probably didn't believe that. I'm sure he had his own uh, belief about who the Lord Jesus Christ was. But he knew hypocrisy when he saw it. The Bible said he knew that they had delivered him up for envy. And so therefore he mocked them. And this was one of the ways that he did it. And people have a tendency to do that. As I said, Elijah did that. But I want you to notice what it says in verse number 39. Luke 23. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him. Saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto him, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. My grandfather used to quote that scripture when I was a boy. And when I was a boy, I had no idea what the Bible said, didn't care. It meant nothing to me. It's just an old ancient religious book until the day I met the Lord. Then it was a book of life. It opened up. But now we're going to look at some ways in here tonight that people consider that you have to go through to be saved, and we're going to compare the, every one of them to this thief on the cross. It has to work that way. If it doesn't agree with the thief on the cross, then we've got an issue presented to us. What's going on? What's happening? What's, what is the issue here? Because you'll notice some things that are missing. There's no baptism. No baptism. There's no uh, essentially no real church involved in it. It's just the thief and Christ. But that boils it down to the essential. For the Bible says plainly in 1 John, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. To have the Son. Therefore the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is salvation. That's important. That's important. It's not so much that he can save you, which he can, but if you have him, you are saved. Because he is the Savior. And it cost him his life to be your Savior. It didn't cost him a dime to create this universe. But it cost him to save your soul. He shed his precious blood. Notice carefully that these both said, Save thyself and us in mockery. 
They both said, would you save us in mockery? But the other one had his soul smite him and he came under conviction and admitted his true condition. It's as simple as that. Who am I? What am I? And he confessed that before God. And when he did, the Lord Jesus Christ could talk to him and to his soul. Do you remember Pontius Pilate when he said to the Lord Jesus Christ, what is truth? You remember that? Do you remember how that those who questioned him talked to him, so forth and so on? That he answered them according to their folly, as it says in the book of Proverbs. But for one who wanted to know the truth, they got the truth. Amen. If you want to know the truth tonight, the truth will make you free. Do you want to be saved tonight? Do you really want to know you're saved tonight? The apostle said, these things are written that you might believe, and believing have everlasting life. Written by the apostle John. And John's gospel is the last gospel written, probably 1995 A.D. The gospel of John is written long after the rejection of the king and rejection of the kingdom. And there are many things that are not in the gospel of John that you'll find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each gospel ends in a certain way. If you look at Matthew chapter number 28, you'll notice how it ends. Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now notice how Mark ends his gospel. Mark chapter number 16. Verse 16. So much for the, for the sunshine and the, and, and the rest of it. I guess the good Lord knew that at least we're not in the, in the, in the path of that hurricane. It's about to hit Florida. I want you to notice now, this is uh, the 16th chapter of Mark. I don't know if you've done much study into this or not, but it's marked out in some Bibles that say it's not in the original text. But I'm going to accept what my Bible says. Okay. I mean, it, you can get rid of something and throw it away. You don't have to explain it and you don't have to deal with it. But let's look at it. In Mark chapter number 16, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So this is the, this is the, uh, the ending of the Gospel of Mark. And essentially it's what's called the commission, the great commission. And if you notice, it differs from Matthew's, not the same thing. The same words aren't spoken. He gives a commission, a great commission in Galilee, all the way 60 miles to the north. Then he gives another great commission in Jerusalem, uh, which of course is 60 miles to the south. And you say, well, is the Bible written to confuse me? No, it's not. Look at Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. And verse number 46. The scripture says, he opened their understanding. They might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And so what you have here is a commission. It's written in the book of Luke for to send forth the disciples. So now what we have is baptism, repentance, and uh, for the remission of sins, and on and on. Now look at John chapter number 21 and verse number 25. John chapter 21 and verse 25. There are other, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Now where's the commission? I want you to go back in verse number 16. And this is the closest thing that you'll find to a commission. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 
And then son of Jonas, verse 17, the same. And he said, feed my sheep. Now, of course, they were talking to an apostle. And you're talking to someone who can write scripture. And the apostle Peter did write scripture, first and second Peter. So where are we? The Jews had a thing called a mikvah. And when I was in Jerusalem, the mikvahs are located right at the base of the steps that lead up to the top of, the, uh, of, the, of, of, of Moriah. And uh, these mikvahs were a ritual cleansing. They would cleanse themselves. They would literally be baptized in the mikvah in preparation for uh, their approach unto God. Uh, to rise to the top of Moriah, of course, where the temple is located, is a very important thing. And every step that is taken is designed to prepare you as you approach unto God and to the top of that mountain. So you notice that water baptism has something to do and it has a connection. Look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 38. Acts 2, 38. The scripture says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, there's an awful lot of churches out there that if you ask them to give you the gospel, they'll take you straight to Acts chapter number 2 and verse 38. That's the gospel. All right. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? Let's go back to the thief. And if you do, then what's the issue with the thief? You understand what I'm trying to say to you tonight? Let's compare the thief, how he got saved, with everything else that's involved in this issue. There's no baptism there. So therefore, can you be saved without water baptism? Was he saved? Well, of course he was. No question. He said, today thou shalt be with me. And he was, of course. He passed on. So he was with the Lord. So there's no question that he was a saved man. So why does God make a difference between the thief on the cross and the Jews? Wonder about that? Think about that for a moment. Why the baptism, why is it introduced? And why in the Apostle Paul, as he begins to write in his ministry, as he moves on in it and calls the Pauline epistles, which we call them the heart of the Pauline epistles, you have those which are called the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. He wrote them when he was in, locked up in his own hired house. If you look at Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, that's the heart of the Pauline epistles. There's no baptism in there to be saved. It's not found. You know why? Because it's later, much later, later than what we're dealing with. Baptism, from my understanding, the way I can see it, is connected with the Jews. And for the reason that God gave it, he gave it for the Jews. Now, there could be a number of reasons for that. It could be that, that he was using that to establish apostolic authority there in the beginning. In plain words, there's the man that can baptize you, so... You know, you go to him and let him baptize you, and and so forth. There's a number of a number of takes on that, and what can how it can be explained. But here's the bottom line: as you move on in the New Testament, and you get down to the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said to church at Corinth, "God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel." Now that is a very confusing statement if baptism is part of the gospel. Right? Nothing could be more confusing than that. Of course, he's not trying to confuse you. He's telling you there's a difference. He's telling you something is happening. He did not send me to preach, the, to, to, to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So the issue of baptism, as far as this preacher believes, is a Jewish thing that has to do with the early Jewish ministry. And, uh, and for all the places it may fit, it belongs there. But when it comes down to us, in Acts chapter number 16 and verse number 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What does he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Not a word about baptism. Why? Why is it not there? Somebody said, well, now you have to take all of what the Bible says. 
All right, let's take it all. Let's go to the thief on the cross and tell me why he wasn't baptized because that's part of all. Okay, that's part of all. If you're going to take all of what it says, then deal with that all. And of course you can't do it because he wasn't baptized, but he went on to glory. So then what must I do to be saved? Well, you're not saved by a prayer. Sinner's prayer. A lot of people are trusting their eternity on the fact that they prayed somewhere at some time and to the leadership of somebody, but their life never changed. And they've lived a godless life all of their life. Yet if you ask them, or a Christian, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. My Sunday school teacher led me to the Lord when I was five or six or seven or eight or whatever. But there's no witness. There's no witness of the Spirit. There's no change of life. Is that person saved? I'm not the judge of humanity. It's not my place to stand between a man and God. And I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to attempt to do that. And I'm not going to come along and tell you what's in your heart and in your soul. I can't do that. I'm not God. But I'm going to tell you this tonight. You better not be trusting a prayer you prayed. You better be trusting Christ. Amen. Salvation is a person. That's the key. It's a person. If you have him, you have him. If you don't have him, you're not saved. But if you have him, you are saved. And if you have him, nobody will ever take him away from you. He's yours forever. He is mine and I am his. That's a beautiful song. He's my savior now. He'll be my savior a hundred trillion years into the future. Forever and ever and ever. You ever think much about eternity? Everlasting life? Now, I take care of my body. I do the best I can with it. I feed it every day. I keep it washed, you know, keep it clean. I rest it. I, I, I have to use it to travel. And um, I, I take my body. I take it over to see the doctor. Doctor will look at my body, and he, he prescribes medication for my body. But regardless of everything I've done, it's still getting older. Man, it hits, it hit 76, 76 years just a few days ago like a ton of bricks. I thought to myself, Lord, have mercy, 76. And, of course, I'm, we've got folks in here tonight that are older than me, but I've had a lot harder life than most of you. Amen. 76, folks. So what are you, what are you trying to say, preacher? This thing is wearing out. So surely your hope is not in your flesh. It's given out. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The new birth is not that your flesh is born again, and it's not that your soul is born again. The new birth is that your spirit is born again, and it is literally born of God. Amen. And the Bible teaches that all through that Old Testament that the spirits return to God who gave it. Now, I got to thinking about this the other day. The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall what? Right. If you live after the flesh, you shall... Right. Oh, death, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The strength of sin is the law. This flesh is dying. The outward man perishes. But I got to thinking about the spirit. You ever thought about the spirit? God's a spirit being. Can God die? What about angels? Have you read anywhere in the Bible where an angel dies? The Bible calls them ministering spirits. Can you, have you read anywhere an uh, angel dies? Fact of the matter is, have you, have you done much research in to find out whether spirits can die, period? Think about that. And the Bible says the spirits of just men made perfect. We are spirits, folks. Not only get scary with you tonight. But we're spirits. The body just happens to be here. One day I'll remove myself from the body. It goes back to the ground from whence it came. But my spirit goes on into the presence of God. Eternal. Eternal. Spirit is eternal. It's not subject to time and decay. And so he gives us eternal life. Think about this now. The unsaved eternal death. Think about that. He gives me the life of God. Would you want to live for eternity in a house with a mailbox and flowers in front of it? Next door neighbors. 
going down to the store to shop. In other words, a glorified earth. You want heaven to be a glorified earth. We don't understand the essence of what we become. He is going to give us of his very life, the life of God. And that is something that, and, and listen, you've already got the earnest of the Spirit, which literally means the down payment, the proof that God's going to do for you what he says he's going to do. And you say, well, I don't know what that is. Then you don't know him. Because there's nobody as big as the Holy Ghost can move into you and you not know it. <laughs> Amen, boy. Amen. So what do you mean, preacher? You started living eternal life, the life of God, at the moment of the new birth, and it will never cease. But my flesh, it's not good for a whole. It's been pretty good. I mean, I've, it's, it's lasted pretty good. I let it sleep every night. It's got to have 8, 9, 10, 12 hours of sleep. It gets wore out. Got to rest it. You know, got to take care of it. I mean, it's all, you talk about vulnerable. Lord have mercy. You talk about weak. I say, well, my flesh not weak. Get out here in your car and T-bone somebody, and you'll find out real fast how weak your flesh is. Oh, yeah, it's weak. It's weak. It's weak. But God has put eternity in my heart. How did he do it? He put his son in my heart. He gave me eternal life. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter number 2 and verse 19, as I talked to you this morning, it said, the devils believe and tremble. Remember that one? And I told you the Greek word is pistuo. All right. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth pistuo on him hath everlasting life. All right. Now, the same word in John 3 is used in, in James 2, pistuo. What's going on here? Same word. You see, James says, the devils pistuo, the devils believe and tremble. But as I told you this morning, remember, this is so important. Look it up in a lexicon when you get home, if you want to. The word pistuo has a much broader meaning than most people give it credit for. On one end of it, it means to trust, to put your faith in, to take hold in the depths of your heart and in your soul. is to receive and trust and reach out and believe with all that is in you. That's saving faith. On the other end of the spectrum, it also, same word means that you make an intellectual ascent, you profess to be something that you're really not, and your life does not bear witness to it. This is what James is talking about. James says, the devils believe. You say you're a Christian, you say you're a believer. Well, the devils believe, and look at them, they're still devils. They believe and tremble. Therefore, what James is teaching pe people is a practical thing. That says, okay, you need to find out if your faith, if your pistuo, if your belief is not here, but down here. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. All right? Once you have believed from the heart to righteousness, you can change your mind. You can say, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. But you're not saved by the mind. You're saved from the heart. The mind is a spiritual thing. The brain is a physical thing. And you're saved from the heart. So have you called upon him from the heart? Have you asked him from the heart? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Somebody said, well, now a preacher or a Sunday school teacher took me down the Roman road. That's fine. But there's also a Galatians road. There's an Ephesians road. There's a Corinthian road. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. Any place in the Bible you get to. The Bible's all interconnected. So any place you go in the scripture, it's connected with another part of the scripture. And every road in that Bible leads you to Christ. That's what's important about it. That's what's important. Care where you go. You can start reading the genealogies in the Old Testament. Get bored to death with them. Wind up leading you to Christ. Why? Because he's the author and the object of the Bible. The author and the object of it. That's what it's about as a person. Now, we know churches that have big preachers. They've got big ministries. They've got big buildings. They've got big this, big that, big this, big that. A lot of them have big problems. And you go into these churches, and all you hear about is they're big, 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 big. 
You need to go to a place where you hear about Christ, 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 Christ. And the acid test is this, and I know this will make some people mad, and I understand that. But in some places, all you hear is Jesus, 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 Jesus. And that's his name, Jesus. And it's Jehovah, the Old Testament, the Savior, the New. But it doesn't hurt to say the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his full title. That's who he is. Because there's another Jesus. All right. There's another spirit. And I guarantee you, Satan does not like the idea of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is master. Curios, Jesus, Jesus, Savior, Christos, Christ, the anointed of God. That's his full title. And I've heard some people who just, I don't know what it is, they just cannot get it out. Do you have any trouble saying that tonight? The Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have any trouble tonight bragging on him, talking about him? exalting him, loving him, worshiping him. These are good indications that what you've got is in the heart and not in the mind. Whether you meet me, know me, ever had no I exist or walk on this earth is irrelevant. But if you do not, do not receive the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've made an eternal choice with eternal consequences. So don't do it. Don't reject him. Don't walk away without him. It's what we're teaching our kids. We want them to know that. We teach them that. The public, the public school system wants to teach them, wants to give them graphic depictions of sodomy. Pure, raw devils. And what we want to do is to tell them about the Lord Jesus. Father, bless your word tonight. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. I hope, if nothing else, that they understand a simple truth. Salvation is a person, and you receive that person, and you believe on that person. Just as that thief on the cross, nobody baptized him. Fact is, nobody really witnessed to him. But he saw the Son of God, and he was drawn to him like we are still to this day, drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. In thy holy name I pray, amen. Brother, let's stand up and sing. Now we have something. Page 403, the All-American Church hymnal. Pass me not. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Why? personal thing to our Lord Jesus Christ would be that, Savior. He said, you call me Lord and Master and do well, so I am. And all things were made by him and for him. So he was. He's the creator. The Bible said, Uphold, up, upholds all things with the word of his power, sustains the universe. But none of that cost him his blood. The Savior did. Amen. And when it did, it changed the Godhead. In him dwelleth the Godhead bodily. So how, what do you mean by that? I mean there's a man in heaven now that wasn't in there before. And there's a man in heaven that's seated at the right hand of the Father. 
And there is a righteousness in heaven that did not exist until the Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. And that righteousness becomes ours because Christ becomes ours. And he has made into us righteousness. My, what a thing that is. What a thing that is. All of it based upon the atonement on the cross. Let's sing one more verse. Let's sing another. We've got people praying down here. Amen. Trusting only in thy marriage Would I seek thy face Heal my wounded broken spirit Save me by thy grace Savior, 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 Savior. He's the Savior. <coughs> He's Master, Lord, God, King, the eternal being, all of that. Yes, He is, absolutely. But He's Savior. 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 Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. What with this little precious girl? I'll be glad to. You better believe it. I'll be glad to. She wants to be anointed with oil. Roberta Sims wants to be anointed with oil. Invite her up this evening. As a privilege, sacred privilege, to be able to do that. Y'all want to come and gather around us? We've got a precious little girl here. I don't know the circumstances. I really don't need to know because I'm not going to, be, going to be the one that heals her. The healer will. Straps, we were healed. And I plead that for her. I plead, I pray for healing. In Jesus' name, bless her, bless her husband and family. And glorify yourself. In thy holy name. Amen. What's her name? Her name is Melody. You can call her Melody. Okay. All right. If you run out of things to pray for now, you got a couple tonight. Amen. Let's stand up and we'll have prayer and let you go. Brother O'Melanick, would you dismiss us tonight, please? Amen. God bless you folks. Be careful. Be careful now.